Shalom Rocha, Chag Sameach everyone. We wanted to thank uh, Rav David Hekmaja, my dear brother-in-law, for inviting me to speak to the Chashu Um When it comes to Pesach, there's a lot to speak about. And secular language. One of the most fascinating things when it comes to the Chag of Passover is the whole idea of Ten Commandments. The ten plagues that Ibn Shalom brought on the Misreen, brought on the Egyptians. The question is, why didn't the God needed to bring ten plagues? What was the reason behind the ten, pl- ten plagues? Why couldn't Ibn Shalom, God, bring one plague and destroy all the Misreen just with one plague? Egyptian. All the Egyptians with one plague. That's one question. The second question, in Mirza Hashem, we're heading towards the Yom Tov Achron, the last days of Pesach. We know very well that the miracles of Kriyas Yamsuf, splitting of the sea, occurred during the Yom Tov of Shavish of Pesach, the seventh day of Pesach. Chazal tell us, we read in the Haggadah Shal Pesach, that the Nisim and Niflos, the miracles that took place on the Shavish Shal Pesach, was much bigger than the, the miracles of the... Ten plagues of the Gisiyas Misraim. How? Because it says by the ten plagues, Espa Elokimhi. It was the finger of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, God's finger, Espa Elokimhi. But it says by the Kriyas Yamsu, by splitting of sea, Ki Yad has a Chazaka. It was a Yad. Rabbi Nosholam split the sea. So what's the comparison from the hand to the finger? It's a fivefold, five times more. So according to every Cheshman, every calculation. We are going to come out that the, the miracles of Kriyas Yamsuf, spilling of the sea, was five folds of the miracles of ten, the ten plagues. The question is why? Why do we need Kriyas Yamsuf? What is the, what is the miracle of Kriyas Yamsuf, Kriyas Yamsuf, the spilling of the sea, all about? Why couldn't God bring about all this miracle all at once, with one miracle? And that would take care of all the Egyptians, and Clarissa would come out of the Egypt, and we would have the Kabbalah Torah right afterwards. Like you promised Pharaoh, three days, we're going to go and be over the Lokim. We're going to go and worship Rabbi Nosholam, our God, and for three days. That should have been it. It should have been one miracle. Make everyone impressed. Kill the Bechor of the Pharaoh and let the Jews out. Why do we need all ten plagues? That's one question. The second question is, why do we need Kriyas Yamsuf? The splitting of the sea. The splitting of the sea. In order to answer these questions, we have to go back to the much deeper idea, a much deeper understanding of the ten plagues. Where does the ten plague come from? Number ten is a very, very special number in the Torah, Tanah HaKadusha. Where do we get number ten from? We are all familiar, in order to have a minyan, we need ten. But it's much deeper, deeper than that. Where do we see the number ten? There's a Mishnah in Avos. There's a series of Mishnahs in Masechta Avos that goes through different tense that was repeated throughout the history of the Israel, throughout the history of Jews. Where was the first ten? Mishnah starts out with the Asara Ma'amaros Nivra Ha'olam. Ribbono Sholam, God created the Bria with ten Ma'amaros, with ten different commands. Then the Mishnah goes on and tells us there were Ribbon Hashem was misnased, gave ten nisyonos, ten different tests to Avraham Avinu. Goes further, the Mishnah tells us there were ten plagues, and then there, was, uh, there, there were ten things that was created, the Nashmashos. There are many tens that the Mishnah goes through, one by one, one after the other, that were repeated throughout the history of creation of the world. But let's go back to the very, very first one, because whenever Rav Sadok HaKohen, one of the biggest mefarshim of the Tanakh, one of the biggest Mkubalim tells uh, tell us that whenever you want to find the source of an idea, you have to look at the first time it was ever mentioned in the Torah. Where is the first time ever something, the number 10 was mentioned in the Torah? Creation of the Bria, creation of the universe. Now, the Mishnah over there asks a very important question. It says, But God could have created the whole Bria with one Mamar, with one command. So why do we need 10 commands? Why do we need 10 different separate commands to create, to create the universe? Why, why couldn't Rabbanu Shalom create one Maimar? The Mishnah goes further and tells us, it tells us, in order to give Sechar to the Sadiqim and to 
give punishment to the Rishayim. That's why the Rebona Shalom created the Bria with ten commands, in order to give rewards to the Sadiqim, to the righteous, and to give punishment to the people who are evildoers, who don't follow the path of righteousness. Now, the question is, what is number 10 has anything to do with giving Sakhar to Sadiqim and punishing the Rishayim, punishing the evildoers? Couldn't God do the same thing, give rewards to the Sadiqim and punish the Rishayim if He would have created the whole universe in one mimer? Couldn't He do that with one command? So now, all of a sudden, when Rebona Shalom used 10 commands, now He's able to give Sakhar to Sadiqim and to give punishment to the Rishayim? So the Rishon in the early Mepharshim of the Mishnah, tell, they tell us because of the Chashivus. When the Rebona Shalom created the Bria with 10 commands, Rabbi Niyono tells us that it gives much more of a Chashivus. When the Sadiq does the mitzvahs of Rebona Shalom, gives Qiyum to the Bria. It gives existence to the Bria. The Bria that was created with 10 commands has much more Chashivus, much more importance. That's why there's more Sakhar for it. That's very well, that explains very well why there's more Sakhar. But from the Mishnah itself, from the context of the Mishnah, is mashma, that is not a matter of giving more sakhar or more punishment. It's a, it's a question of giving sakhar and punishment, not more or less. Now, that's, that's a much deeper question. One of the early Akhroni, one of the, the, one of the other Mepharshim of the Mishnah, they wrote a sefer called Ruach Chaim, Rav Chaim Olajin. He was one of the Talmud of the Vinagam. He was actually a pioneer of the yeshivas that we have nowadays. The, the yeshivas that exist nowadays, he started by Rabchaim Vulajin, the Vulajin yeshiva. Now, Rabchaim Vulajin, in his Pirush and Mishnah and Avas, Ruach Chaim, he gives us a much deeper insight of this Mishnah and Avas. Rabchaim Vulajin explains that Ribbon Sholom could have created the universe with one mimer. You know what the, what's the difference between creating the universe with one command as opposed to ten command? What does it mean, one mimer? One, what the difference between mimer is, one mimer and ten mimer, is basically the understanding of the olam. That Ribbon Shalom created the universe, and in Lashon HaKadosh, universe is called olam. Why is the universe called olam? Um, those people who know Hebrew, the shortest of the word olam is he'elem. He'elem means hastaras pani. Ribbon Shalom created the universe in order that it should be a Hastaras Panim. What does Hastaras Panim mean? In order that Ribbon Shalom should cover himself from his creation. Now, why do we need that? Why do Ribbon Shalom need to cover himself up? He has to hide behind the curtain? But that's what the, the word Olam is all about? That's what He'elem is all about? Ha'alama, Olam, universe is about Ribbon Shalom hiding himself from the creation? Ramchal tells us, that the reason Ribbon Shalom created the universe is in order that it should be native to the Bria. It should know that it should be a, should do good to the Bria and it should give Hatava, right? In order it should it should give from his goodness to the creation. Now, Ribbon Shalom wants that Hatava, the Tov that he wants to give to the every Nivra to be complete. How is that Hatava is going to be complete? If we earn it, it's much more complete as opposed to if you get it as a gift. Why? Imagine someone comes to you and tells you, I want to give you a gift. I want to give you a gift. Now, you were very happy. Normally, a person is very, very happy. Someone comes and he tells you, I'm going to give you a, a Pesach gift, Passover gift. It's very, very, makes a person very excited. Someone loves you. But now, if someone comes and tells you, I want to give you $100,000, $200,000, $300,000, and you haven't worked for it, <laughs> there is a sense of embarrassment, there's a sense of busha, that I didn't earn it, I wasn't the one that worked for it, so why am I worthy of getting this? That sense of embarrassment takes away from the beauty and enjoyment of the gift. Reborn Shalom doesn't want, doesn't want it that it should be any fisaron, anything missing from that hatava that he wants to give to the human being. So what does Reborn Shalom do? Reborn Shalom makes it that we should earn that hatava. We should be the ones that are earning that goodness. Instead of getting it as a gift, he wants us to earn it. That it should, in order that it shouldn't be a nama de kisufa. There should not be an embarrassment involved. But how do we earn it? The only way we are able to earn it is we choose it. It's when we choose the toiv, when we choose the chaim, we choose the toiv, is as if that we earned it. 
So the Bono Shalom has to create two choices, has to create good and evil, and he has to create Tov and Ra in order for us to choose the Tov, and by us choosing the Tov, it's as if that we are the ones that we are earning it, and then the Hatava is going to be complete. So there has to be a choice. Now, in order for us to have a Bechira, to have a free will, Rebun Hashem has to give us that possibility. Now, if Rebun Hashem is watching us every single second, it's impossible for us to have Bechira, to have a free will. Because we have to follow Rebun Hashem. We know Rebun Hashem is watching us. We know Rebun Hashem is above us. Imagine that all of us, we have kids, you know, when the first person has children, it's a tremendous lesson in Chinuch for educating our children. As the child grows, slowly maturely, the person has to give him himself, give him independence. If the father would micromanage his children every single second, if the, if the child grows to become a teenager, it could backfire. Why? Because the child wants to have his own independence. Obviously, you don't start giving independence to a child as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, but slowly maturely, you have to let go. And you have to let the child to make his own decisions in order to be able to become an adult. That's part of growing up. It's the same thing with the Bono Shalom. The Bono Shalom wants us to be independent, to have that free choice. The only way it's possible for us to have that free choice is by the Bono Shalom taking himself away and letting us be the manage, manager, letting us be the one choosing between the Tov and Ra. That possibility only comes about only if Rebbe Hashem as Kav Yochol hiding himself from the Bria. That's what it means, Hasaras Panim. Hasaras Panim means when Rebbe Hashem hides himself and as if to say that Rebbe Hashem is not there. Of course he's watching us. Rebbe Hashem is in control. Rebbe Hashem is a Kol Yochol. It's just like the father to the son. The father is watching his son very carefully. But he let go. Sometimes he as if he overlooks things. In order for the child to have a Bechira, in order for a child to have that free choice. That's the idea of Bechira. That's, what the, that's the idea of Ha'alama. That's the idea of creation, creating the Bria with the He'elem, with Hastaras Panim. That's what the universe is. In the Lashon HaKodesh, again, Olam means Ha'alama. It means Hastaras Panim. It means Ribbon Hashem covering himself from the Bria. That's why Ribbon Hashem did not create the universe with one command. That's why Rebbe Hashanah did not create the universe with one mimer. Because if Rebbe Hashanah would have created the, the, the creation with ten mimer, with one mimer, Kav Yochol, it would have been such a close relationship to the creation that we would not have that Bechira anymore. That's why there has to be a multitude of commands. There has to be more than one mimer. Now, why is it ten and not number two? So, Mekubalim tell us, because it, it number has to have that possibility of going back to one. It has to be a multitude. It has to be more than one. But it can't be two. It can't be three. It can't be four. It has to be number ten. Because number ten, even though it has the multitude in it, even though it's a multitude of numbers, but at the same time, it brings a unity. It could bring it back to number one. The Mispar Katan, which means the, nu the lower numerical value of the youth, is, is, uh, is one. Right, from 10, we go to 1. It's a lot of achdut. That's why Asara creates a minion. It's one body. It's not 10 different individuals. Now there's all one body that is right to have the Shekhinah to be shared. That's why Rabbi Hashem created Bria with more than one mimer, with two mamar, with right, more than one mimer, but at the same time, it's exactly 10 because he has the power to bring it back to 1 through the Kayak of Bechira of the human being. That's why the creation came about with ten mamarat. Now, all of these number ten in the Mishnah and Avas are all related to each other. It's all the number ten, it goes back to the number ten of creation of the universe. So the reason we have Asara Makot, the reason we have ten, the ten Makot, and Rebbe Shalom brought ten Makot on Mishraim, it has to do with number number 10 of creation of the Bria. Now, why? Why does it have to do with each other? Because when the Buddha Shalom brought about the 10 Makas, the 10 plates on Misri, what the Buddha Shalom was doing was, he was taking away that Hastaras Panim, those curtains that was between him and the creation. 
every mimer, every command, he brought another level of the hastaras upon him in the bria. Now every maka, every plague that was brought in Misraim in Egypt took away another level, another curtain of hastaras upon him. HaKadosh Baruch Hu revealed himself more and more throughout the ten plagues of Misraim. Every plague was uh, brought about another revelation, another hashba, another way of re reaching out, to re another clarity to Rebbe Shalala. So, Clary Shalala will be able to see that. That's what Chazal said. With every Makkah, with every plague that Rebbe Shalala brought in, in Egypt, there was more of a clarity for Clary Shalala. There was a refuah. It healed Clary Shalala. It was the Rufua for Clarissa because of Clarissa we were able to get to know Ribbon Shalom more and more. We were able to see the hand of Ribbon Shalom in the Bria more and more. And Chazal tells us in a deeper understanding, really, if you look at it, when, what was the, la the last Makkah? was Makkah's Bechoros. What was the first Maimar? Chazal tells us, Bereshit Baral, Bereshit Baral, Kimet Hashemayim et Ha'ares. The first mamor, the first command that Ribbon Shalom created the Bria was Bereshit Baral, Kimet Hashemayim et Ha'ares. Now what is the word Bereshit stands for? If you look at the Rashi on the Chumash, Rashi tells us Bereshit stands for Bishvil Yisrael Shenikra Rashit. Because of Klai Yisrael who are called Rashit. Beni Bechori Yisrael, Klai Yisrael are called Bechor of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Ribbon Shalom created the Bria Bereshit Bishvil Israel because of Klai Yisrael who are called Rashid, who are called Bechor. Because Klai Yisrael are the Bechor of Ribbon Shalom. Klai Yisrael are the firstborn of Ribbon Shalom. When Ribbon Shalom killed the Bechor of Misrim, the climax of Yisrael Misraim, which is Pasach al Bas Avotenu, Pasach al Bas Avotenu, our Shvach who skipped uh, the house of our fathers and he didn't kill the Bechor of Klai Yisrael and he killed the Bechor of the Egyptians. He was Megale that the Bechor of Klar Yisrael is Bechor of himself, is the firstborn of Ribbon Shalom. And Klar Yisrael is the firstborn of Ribbon Shalom. That's the climax of uh, the Yesias Misraim. That's not the end of Yesias Misraim, but that's the climax of Yesias Misraim. By Makas Bechor, Klar Yisrael left Yesias Misraim. That was the Gilui of Bereshis Baral Okim Esashem, Yesias Misraim, of leaving Egypt. What's the second Mimer? By he or Ribbon Shalom brought about the or. What's the ninth Maka? Makas Khoishekh. There was a Khoishekh from Egyptians, but don't make a mistake, there was only a Khoishekh, was a darkness for the Egyptians. There was a light for Klai Israel. There was a Rufua for Klai Israel. That's Khoishekh of Misraim. Khoishekh of Misraim revealed the light of the creation of the Bria, by he or. And so on and so forth. You can correspond every single one of the plagues of in, the, in Egypt to one of the Mamorot, one of the commands that Ibn Shalom brought about the, the, the creation. Now, that makes sense very well. Now we can understand why Ibn Shalom brought about Dafka exactly 10 plagues, 10 Makot, and not one Makkah. Why Ibn Shalom didn't only use one Makkah to bring about Christ, to bring Christ out? Because the whole idea is to take away all those curtains that created darkness in the Bria, in the beginning of the creation. To get Christ ready for the Kabbalah Torah. Now it doesn't end there. Really, the Yesiat Misraim does not finish, leaving Egypt does not finish until Kriyat Yamsuf. Pesach doesn't finish until Kriyat Yamsuf, until Shevisha Pesach. Kriyat Yamsuf is embedded in part of Yisrael Mishraim, is the end of Yisrael Mishraim. Now, why Kriyas Yamsu is the end of Yisrael Mishraim? Why Kriyas Yamsu, the miracle of Kriyas Yamsu was much bigger? As we explained before, the ten plagues was corresponding to the Asar Ma'amorot, to Ma'ase Bereshit, to the creation of the Olam Hatachton, which is Ma'ase Bereshit. What is Kriyas Yamsu? It's very interesting. If you look at the song that the Mo Moses, that Moshe Rabbeinu sang by Kriyas Yamsuf, it's called the Az Yashir. Now, in the song of Az Yashir, there's one statement that is really the climax of Kriyas Yamsuf. Pasuk says, Pasuk tells us, Sus v'rochmo rama bayam. Now, how do I know this Pasuk, this verse, is a, a climax of Kriyas Yamsuf? Because we see when Miriam 
also afterwards composed a similar song. That's the pasuk that is repeated by Shiras Miriam. Again, there's a song that Moshe Rabbeinu sang with a man, that's the Oz Yashir, and there's a song called Shiras Miriam that Miriam, the, the Shirat Miriam that Miriam sang with the Nevi'ah, right? Miriam and Nevi'ah, the sister of Moshe Rabbeinu sang with all the Nashim. But this pasuk is repeated. Sus v'rochmo Rama Bayam. What does that mean, Sus v'rochmo Rama Bayam? Sus and a Rochev. The horse and a Rochev. Who is a Rochev? The person who is riding the horse. The person who is control of the horse. Who is riding the horse. Rama Bayam. They were floating on the water. They were drowning in the water. Now, what does that represent? Imagine, you are the one driving, driving a car. So who is in control of the car? Obviously you, because you are the one driving the car. So you're completely in control. You are the one driving the car. You are completely in control. In the olden days, they didn't have cars. What did they have instead? They have horses. The person who is riding the horse, he's technically speaking, he's completely in control. He is the one that is control of the horse. The horse drives, the horse goes because of the person who's riding the horse. He's completely in control. When Ribur and Sholem drowned the horse along with the person who was riding the horse, Ribur and Sholem revealed that who is, the ultimate, who is ultimately in control? Not the one who is riding the horse, but who? By Hakadosh Baruch Hu is the one in control. That sus v'rochmoro That's the gilui of what? The gilui, the revelation of Kriyas Yamsuf. The revelation of Kriyas Yamsuf was sus v'rochmoro ramayam. That Ibn Hashem is in the full control of the control of the bria. We think that we are in control, but ultimately Ibn Hashem is in control. That revelation came about in Kriyas Yamsuf. Rabbi Sai, Rabbi Tai. That's Master Merkava. That's the higher revelation than Master Breshit. That's Master Merkava. That's the Chaloim of Yecheskel. That's the Navi, that's the Haftarah that we read by Shavuot. Right? Chazal tells us that the Haftarah that we read by Shavuot is a story of Yecheskel, in one of the mysteric stories of the Tanakh, that reveals to us how Ribbon Shalom controls not only the Ares, not only the earth, but the Olamot Yonim, the upper universes, and that's Master Merkava. That's above Bechira. That's above that. Ibn Shalom is above the Bechira of the human being. Right? Master Breshit, Ibn Shalom is Megale, Bene Bechori Israel, the Klar Israel are the one, that are the Bechor of Klar Israel, Klar Israel are the one that are Boicher. We have the free will, to, we have the Sechar Va'onis to choose the right path. That's Master, master of Yisiyat Misraim. That's the ten, ten plagues. But Kriyash Yamsuf, it brings about the higher revelation of Ribbon Shalom. What is that higher revelation? It's Master Merkava. That's what we are hoping to get. And everyone, according to, own limit, according to their own level, be able to experience that hashba that is going to come about during the, 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 during the, 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 during the Master Merkava. That's what Master Merkava is all about. May Ribbon Shalom help us out that we should be zoiche to that gilui of Master Merkava and the Mir Sashem should be zoiche to come down with Shafim Rabbi Amen Amen. Amen.